All right, take two. Hopefully this is getting through to you guys. Sometimes the signal will dip out, but uh, I'll always try to get back quick. Woo. All right, there we go. So I wanted to talk to you guys. I'm glad it's working right here. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about a few different things today. A lot of people have been asking about the way I manage my garden. Um, and, I, and I usually do it through uh, Throso, which is called broadcasting in a traditional um, nomenclature. And so I wanted to talk about how I do that, why I do that, what are the other options? Why are there these other options? And where, how are they effective? Um, so I wanna take you all through that, okay? All right, so we're gonna be talking about how we water, we're talking about throw, sow, direct seed, transplanting, we're gonna be talking about cuttings and division. And if we've got time, we could talk about companion planting and guilds and seed mixes and uh, maybe even land races, okay? Um, all right, so first off, how do you water? Because that makes a huge difference. Um, if you're just watering with a hose and you're not putting on something on there to make it a soft, um, gentle rain on your, on your newly planted seeds, certain seeds are gonna get washed away, right? If you're just spraying it with a hose, you know, certain seeds are going to, of course, get washed away. Um, and if they're uh, seeds that are in the soil, maybe you'll expose them um, as you wash with something, uh, or as you water with something abrasive like that. So that is a very big issue. Um, something if you if, if, that's really instructive is to run a, a lawn sprinkler on, on bare soil and just watch what happens and just sit there and observe it. Uh, you'll learn a lot um, from just doing that. What happens is when it goes straight above itself, it's got the most force downward. And then when it's going like this, it's actually, the force is, 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 is much less because it's off angle as it, it goes like this and then hits, you know, instead of just straight back down. So you might find if you're doing, um, if you're growing um, food and you're using a lawn sprinkler right around the actual sprinkler where it's directly vertical, you might find that um, you get a lot of weeds uh, because your other plants didn't establish because they can't, couldn't handle that smacking of water against it. That's usually what it does, is it smacks. So, um, it, and it's hard, right? We can't, all, we can't all do that, right? And when we can't all have um, our choice of watering situation, what we need to do is plan our planting situation to match that. And, and you'll understand as I get through here, as I go into this. So overhead watering, you know, it's, it's erosive, right? Um, there's all these other options. Um, there's, there's, there's drip, and this is an expensive option for most, most people. There's the drip irrigation. Uh, and there's like different forms of this. This is where you can set it up and, and, and you can literally have little sprayers, that little spray attachments, and you can have things that literally drip or, or have even stronger flows of water. You can have this Ola pot system where it's unsealed, unglazed pottery and it's clay and you put water in it and it literally just weeps the water. And when it's in the ground, it creates this equilibrium between the soil and it. And when the soil is damp enough, it stops leaking. They call them leaky pots too. They also have misters. Um, if any of you have worked with stuff in a greenhouse, you'll find that misting a lot and not watering as much really, really helps uh, certain things like um, roots, rooting, rooting on uh, cuttings really, really are, is affected by this. So rain, rain is incredible. Uh, there's really specific reasons why rain is incredible and it's different from us watering our plants with uh, groundwater. Um, they're, they're completely different. One is going to react differently with the soil entirely. Um, and so flood irrigation is another option that is very traditional. Uh, if you have the water, you can do it, uh, but that is very gentle because it's like a capillary effect where it's seeping through and saturating. So the idea is to be as gentle as possible when we're watering especially when we're just planting seeds. So we wanna be as gentle, hey Steven, 
We're, we want to be as gentle as possible. Uh, we don't want to uh, water hard. Because when we do that, we remove soil. Uh, and this is, this is exactly why people love mulch. Because what happens when water hits the mulch is it gets split. Each, all, that particle of water gets split and that force gets, gets split as well. And so we're, 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 we're blunting that force, we're separating the water, it's, it's, and it's also interacting with, with mulch that it, um, that it needs to help break down. So we're soaking that mulch which, and it's compressing and, and more soil life is, uh, is reaching it because it's compressing, more surface area is created as it breaks down. All those fun things start happening, right? So rain is amazing. Um, and then being as gentle as possible is amazing. Mulch is amazing. Uh, it's, it's a way of creating that gentleness. Um, and if you have to water uh, from above, uh, shift towards being more hardy. Uh, you can of course water uh, an orchard uh, situation with overhead, um, but then you have the, the trees blocking with their branches at a certain point, and, and that's the infiltration too. Um, but it all boils down to observing your situation and seeing the actual watering process happen. Because people will set things up and walk away. Two weeks later, the plants will be growing and creating screens to the water. And so it'll be like shh. And then on this side, they're not being reached any longer. So it's really critical, whatever you decide to do or start with, that you observe enough or take time out during the growth uh, season to observe your watering situation. Okay, now we'll talk about throw so. So as I said, it's broadcasting um, and I'll come back to questions uh, a little bit later, but I'm just gonna get through, through, through what I'm here to talk about and then I'll answer questions. <clears throat> so um, I really see these as two different groups. I see them as uh, the dry self seeders um, and then the wet rot and sprout crew. And so in my mind, the plants that are actually drying down seed on the plant, if you just left it alone, that plant would release those seeds and they'd be dry and perfect. And you're literally, all you're doing when you're seed saving these plants from these plants, is taking the seed and finishing the drying process. And you're like not doing anything. And it's this very easy process. In nature, um, you would just take those and, well, oh, not, I mean, in your, in your natural garden, right? You would just take those and you could just spread them around. And in wilderness, it's the same thing. You can just grab those and collect them before they spring or get carried by the wind or fall to the ground or are consumed or taken and redistributed. There's all these different processes. But we can step in in those moments and we can be, be one of those animals taking the, uh, you know, one of the forces taking the, those seeds and, and removing them or putting them in a new place or eating them. Um, so the dry self seeders, I mean, these are typically the broadcasters, the traditional broadcasters like legumes, like beans and peas, um, the grains. Uh, so we're talking about like, like millet. This is a wonderful, a wonder, and this is from our website. I've used this for years. This is how I make organic straw. A lot of people lament the fact that there's really like no organic straw and they're spraying Roundup on straw to desiccate it at the end of the season to dry it down. And so I just throw this, I throw so this and people are like, oh, but it's millet, that's bird food. And it's like, yeah, you know what happens is um, it grows and the birds come, the little birds come and eat from it and they're teeny. And so their beak size, remember, uh, remember the whole uh, Darwinian thing on Galapagos Island where the birds match their beak to the seed size? Small little beaks. So they're not gonna eat my corn. Um, they're gonna eat my millet and spread it because they're messy eaters. And so this is kind of constantly being replanted at, uh, in my garden in California and the birds love it, but it's these little birds. So they're eating the insects on my plants but they're not eating the seeds uh, or hurting my other plants that I really care about. Something to think about. It's a strategy of distraction uh, that gives me a secondary yield and the birds are, every time they, they land, um, they deposit um, uh, 
fertilizer for, for my, my garden as well. And people talk about how there's like phosphorus, uh, peak phosphorus, ah, but you know, birds are providing that nitrogen, you know, in their fertilizer all the time, wherever they go. Pretty magic. So yeah, millet's really awesome. Um, this cowpea, this clay cowpea, this is my, this is the cowpea I used to transform my garden. And um, after taking Jeff Lawton's uh, online permaculture design course, he was like, cowpeas, get in there as soon as you cut the earth and throw cowpeas all over it and other legumes like peas, you know? And so I went cowpea crazy. And cowpeas are the fastest uh, biomass and nitrogen, uh, nitrogen accumulator to pair with corn um, on the planet that they've tested in a lot of tests. Of course, you know, we're always finding new things, right? And maybe we'll find a special cowpea that's especially good at this. But... These tests are amazing. Um, this plant, the cowpea and black eyed peas, we all know, right? They're a cowpea. They're incredible. They're so vigorous and they're incredibly tasty as well. So this is, an, this is something I think every gardener should be using to cover up their soils, to uh, enrich their soils. And I throw sow these. These are so vigorous that you throw sow them and they'll grow over your roof. I had them all climbing all over um, the porch roof in, in, in California. Now I'm missing the porch roof, covered with cowpeas. All right, so, um, and, and I'll, I'll get back to, um, I'll get back to the, the self-seeders and uh, the dry self-seeders in a second. All right, so the wet uh, hot, uh, I mean the wet rot and sprout, they are, th they are different. What you wanna do with those, and people know this, you take, the, uh, you take the tomato at the end of the season, you throw it, the rotten tomato, you throw it, that's where it'll grow next year, right? We all know that. So it rots and then it sprouts. Or if you've ever seen tomatoes that you've left out too long and they're sprouting, the seeds that are sitting in the sun, and they're sprouting in, in the rot, that's the same thing that happens to squash. You ever leave a squash that's really ripe out and then you cut it open and the seeds are sprouted inside it? It's the same sort of deal. These guys, uh, wet, rotten sprout, um, squash, melons. Um, it's, it's also how you um, seed save from them. So it's a wet um, seed saving process uh, for these to make clean seed. So in my mind with those, I'm like, all right, you're gonna rot in place and sprout next year. So I don't really need to worry about you. You're waterproof, you're rot proof, you're designed to handle all this stuff. And so I've thrown sown those. Uh, and though even though most people will, you know, they'll plant, they'll direct seed uh, their squash. Um, I've, I've done it. And I've also done it with my tomatoes. I've even actually thrown sown some tomato seeds to see if that works. And they're really light seeds and I've, I've had variable, uh, um, uh, variable success with that. And I'll get into why in a second. So we really need to train our seeds. So um, I can talk about regreening re the desert late, uh, later. I have a bunch of friends who have done that. Um, we need to train our seeds to throw sow by throw sowing them. We're literally gonna walk around the garden and throw them on bare earth. You don't wanna start training them on mulch or like among other plants to begin with. When they're trained, when they're strong and vigorous, you can start trying that out. But first start them on cleared ground, just like as you would any annual. That really helps uh, because that lowers the competition. Uh, and then um, profusely, plant profusely, because how out of the 100 or 200 seeds that you plant in that area, how are you gonna identify the best out of the 100? By planting 100 and letting 50 die or 60 die and then plucking out the weaker ones or chopping them or, 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 or whatever your process. But it's really uh, the stun method. Mark Shepard talks about this, uh, New Forest Farm. Um, he, he has the stun method, uh, strategic total utter neglect. And so we all can do this in our gardens too. We can water as little as possible and strategically back off and see the reaction and, and test and observe. So we figure out what actually the capabilities, what actually the genes are containing. So we really don't know when we're babying these plants what these plants can do. And what I've learned, I've almost trialed a thousand of these plants from Baker Creek. What I have learned over the years is we do not have any idea what these plants can do. 
they're, they're going to continue to surprise us. They're going to continue to shock us, amaze us. And we need to partner and allow those things to happen. So um, we need to be adding to the soil, uh, the soil bank. So everyone's like, chop, drop, build that topsoil layer. That's great. But if you're chopping, dropping your weeds um, and before they form seeds, you're not forming any, you're, not, you're forming topsoil with no seeds in it. But if you want to make it even easier on yourself and want instead of weeds popping up, you want good plants, at the end of the season, go around and shake the plants, you know, and spread those seeds out and then work on the actual seed bank of the soil. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if, if you walk away from your garden and it's trained to handle, uh, to grow on seasonal rains and it's all self-seeders, and or an illness happens or you know anything happens you come back and your garden's there again because you trained those plants those seeds that soil it's pretty amazing i've done it and it, it's really awesome okay so direct seed so this is the classic the classic um oh yeah and then distraction i, I was going to talk about this so to keep birds a lot of people are like, okay, birds, what, you're going to throw the seeds in the ground? What about the birds? So um, what you do, because I've dealt with this, they don't figure it out at first. <laughs> they don't realize what you're doing. Um, and they learn. And that's what's so crazy about this is the, the, the birds communicate and learn and figure it out. But um, most of the time, it has to do with um, the layout of the trees. So if you think like a bird, you got to think about the birds of prey. And if you're in this runway where you've got free runway on either side to swoop down and grab a bird, a smaller bird that's coming down to just look at the ground and get all focused and start, you know, going through your soil and your garden soil, it will swoop down and kill it. And that you can actually um, create uh, kestrel boxes to encourage these predatory birds. You can have um, owl boxes for the nighttime. You can um, put reflective uh, mylar or glass or plastic or metal. This can be a recycling, upcycling moment. You can put those in strings along above your garden in your fruit trees um, and that keeps the birds away. I would caution though that this keeps, the this keeps the birds away, but it allows the bugs to just do their thing. So when, when, we, when, we give the, when we attract the right kind of birds, we actually make it so they don't interfere with us if we feed them. They prefer, birds prefer the bugs. They'll be landing on food and they won't eat the food. They'll be eating the bugs on the food if there's bugs on the food, right? And uh, just like Stefan Sokobiak in uh, the Miracle Farms in Quebec, he would have honeysuckles going with his cherries and they'd be all over his honeysuckles and leaving his cherries alone because he set it up so that he would have uh, them taken care of during that time period. And then meanwhile, they'd still be running their pest control operation for free, which is nice. Okay. Um, yeah, and then you could do fishing line actually over your sprouts. I don't know if you guys know about this, but you can suspend a fishing line above where your sprouts are growing. So where, I mean, some people have birds that actually will eat, they'll snip the sprout itself and it will kill the growing, the growing uh, plant, the seedling. Uh, so you could do that too. It's just, it's really just a fishing line. Uh, a 20 pound fishing line supposedly is the best probably because it's thick enough for them to try landing on them. And they're like, what is wrong? And then they fly away. <laughs> um, so it's all about making it confusing and not quite right to animals. Like when I did put everything on swales, which are just on contour paths in a garden, so they're perfectly flat. I noticed the deer don't come inside my garden because they step on the path and they're like, what's going on, Albert? It's flat here and they don't like it. It feels just unnatural to them. <laughs> so um, it, if we create patterns that favor us, 
but meanwhile allow the stability and the balancing elements of the natural systems to flourish, we, we will prevent um, imbalances from happening, like removing all the birds and then having tons of bugs happen or, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. We, we have to find that balance. All right, so, hey Eric, um, direct seeding. All right, so the reason we do direct seeding is because it puts the seeds directly in contact with the soil. Um, it hides the seeds from the birds. And it allows the seed to develop a, a, a deep enough root so that when it's bigger, um, it's safe. You know what I mean? Because the majority of it's below soil. So that things can happen to it above ground like, and, and it, it can be hardy and strong because it can moderate with, with the, the greater portion of it being below soil. So planting depth. A lot of people debate about what the exact depth is going to be for that seed, but it's actually quite simple um, because I've gotten a lot of these bigger seed um, in my against trays. Uh, no, I'm not leaning against anything. <laughs> okay, I'll answer questions later. Um, the seed usually plants, uh, you plant it as deep as it is, is wide, uh, or you can plant it just so it's covered. Um, it, I've actually, okay, so in training my throw sow seeds, I've tested a lot of things. You can get squash to throw sow, even though it's big and edible and, and whatnot, you can th throw sow these. You can throw sow corn, um, even though that doesn't seem, doesn't seem possible, I've done it. Um, it's not as successful as direct seeding. So I would totally um, direct seed my corn. And that's what I did with, uh, that's what I did with my, my Peruvian corn because what I did was I threw through it with everything else and then went back because they were so visual and huge. And I poked them in and sl slightly covered them. So that's how I did those. Um, you would direct seed stuff that's surface sown like the Rodira um, red carrot, the, I, would, I would totally make sure, because if I threw this, the wind would take it. It's so delicate. So I would press this into the soil, preferably moist soil, and I would get it, I would make sure that it had contact with the soil, that there was moisture, so that it would start the germination process, and that it wouldn't blow away. You can even lightly um, cover this with uh, silty, silty soil. Um, if it's like clay soil, you might, you might just lose things if it's really thick and goopy. <laughs> but yeah, if you, you can lightly cover these things, um, but, but just barely. Yeah, they're very surface sun, they're very teeny seeds. Um, beans, peas. Um, a lot of times you would plant these all the way in because they just are this soft, um, wonderful treat for any animal walking by to eat. Um, and then, and then later on when you, like your peas have grown a little bit and their root structures developed, when something comes along and snips them, they regrow. I mean, that's what pea shoots are, right? Pea shoots are based on the concept that you can just keep cutting and they regrow. And same thing works in our garden. Uh, and a lot of times that's what gets our plants through that season is their ability to regrow or respond resiliently to something transplanting. All right, so when, when transplanting, um, majority of the, of the rules, um, people say you can't transplant certain things, right? They really mean you can't harm or damage the root structure. Um, and if you do, that plant will go through transplant shock um, and may never fully recover to what it would have been. So transplant shock is when the roots realize that something's different. They're like, wait, something's wrong. Recalibrate everything. Ah. And they're like, they're very sensitive and it, it takes a while to calm them down, two to three weeks usually. And it can set you back and that whole using trays inside thing, all that you know, extra energy and time you put in, you just lost uh, because of transplant shock. So if you're transplanting, uh, one of the best ways to uh, counteract the shock or prevent the shock is compost tea. Um, or you can mycorrhizal, uh, using a mycorrhizal inoculant. And these will partner with the plant that goes into the ground and partner with the soil micro, uh, microbes that are already there in the soil life 
and basically act as a translator. They, they, they will be the go-between between this new plant and the community that is there in place, and they will form bridges between the two. They'll be ambassadors, and they'll allow your plant to have a warm reception in the soil. Uh, and, and scientifically, what's going on is it's, um, they're supplying enough life that they will be, be the economic go-between of the soil economy and the plants. So they would uh, increase, uh, mycorrhizal inoculants would increase the surface area of the, the roots and increase the uptake and absorption of nutrients from the soil. Um, the compost tea uh, would do something very, very similar, um, but it would uh, provide a full palette, a full spectrum of multiplied soil life that you got from that site and make compost out of, and then you released into the, uh, into the compost tea, and then you would multiply it by, by the process, that process, and then you would give it back to the, to the soil at such high densities that the plant can be like, ooh, I choose you guys, you're on my team. All right, let's go, 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 go. And then they build their resiliency because they have exactly enough of what they need. It's really about providing a, a banquet of options. All right, so, Cuttings. All right, so cuttings are really, really fun because it's like insta-plant. And uh, it, it's really rewarding if you choose soft, uh, soft wood cuttings. Uh, hardwood cuttings are much harder. Um, so uh, yeah, fig, grape, uh, even pomegranate, I've gotten to, I've gotten to, uh, I've gotten to uh, root. Fig is probably the easiest. You could take a fig cutting, a fresh fig cutting, and you could probably put it in the ground in the right conditions and have it root. I've not seen that done. I've heard of that done. The way I did it was I soaked, I would cut it and soak it in uh, willow water. And that's a great natural rooting hormone. There's these um, two um, elements uh, in all salix uh, varieties, all willow varieties. And if you boil, cut up pieces of... Uh, willow branch and then let it uh, sit overnight in that it will make a tea that you can soak uh, you can water things in uh, and, and soak things in and it will make it root like crazy so figs will, will root like crazy uh, like that um, grapes can also root uh, they can be a little bit trickier than figs uh, so start with figs if you're gonna root something and they're also really good to do that with because sometimes you don't know what the variability will be. And if you want that exact fruit, that's a really good way to do it because it's vegetative. So grafting, uh, this is where we make cutting branches off one variety and putting it onto another. Uh, this is apples and stone fruit and pear and stuff like that. And then there's slips and, and suckers. And so uh, slips are like when you take a like when you take a sweet potato and you suspend it in a jar of water, what happens is it starts sprouting. And its roots come out of the bottom and green stuff comes out the top. And you can actually detach some of these, these sprouts on top and then root those. And those are called slips. And you can just take all those, those little growths off of that sweet potato and constantly be making new sweet potato plants from that. Um, and then suckers, like let's say if we have a fruit tree and we put all this mulch at the bottom of the fruit tree, it's going to, around the base of it, start sprouting suckers. And a lot of people are like, ah, the suckers, no, 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 we don't like those. But if you want more rootstock or more of that plant, it takes energy out of the plant. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not gonna argue that. Um, but what you can do is you can get more rootstock, more trees with those suckers by um, leaving that mulch on there and allowing it to root out. And then you cut it right where it meets the tree and there's another root. And so you suddenly have this cutting with a root on it and you can plant it. And then, you know, later on you can graft onto that and then you have a, another, another grafting project. Okay, so um, division. So this is vegetative. This is very similar to this idea of getting a cutting, um, but this is more like for like herbs and, um, and, and, and stuff like that. So like mint, you would take a chunk of that mint plant and then it would spread. And then uh, like lemon balm, oregano, all, all, all these kind of herbs that do that. 
And then, uh, speaking of vegetative growth, you have things like potatoes, where uh, they will, you can cut them into sections, leaving eyes on them, and dry them out overnight, and so it forms that skin. And then you could plant those, and then make more potatoes that way. And same thing that works with juice some artichokes, um, and, and um, lots of root crops like that. So, that's what I wanted to talk about. And we could talk about companion planting uh, gills and mixes and stuff. Uh, companion planting is this idea that you pair certain plants together because they benefit each other in some manifestation. And when we talk about that, uh, when we think more than just companion, like two, right? Uh, we're thinking guilds because they're working together, right? And so, um, like the three sisters as a plant guild, and the three sisters are corn, squash, and uh, beans. And they work together uh, to provide um, each other different things so that at the end of the day, you get a better yield uh, from just one of them alone. Uh, the way it's described is that uh, raccoons don't like going over the squash. I've yet to see this. I, I want to see that, squ that raccoons will enter the squash field and then go, ah, and run away. I've not seen that yet. But uh, supposedly the squash, but I know what the squash do for me. The squash actually create a canopy above the soil so that soil evaporation is caught on the bottom of their leaves and then recycled back in. It creates this little microclimate canopy situation, which is really nice. Uh, and when we water, it hits first that leaf and then it goes down the leaf and, right? And so there's, there's not that impact on the soil too. So um, that's really important for me and erosion and whatnot. Um, and then you have the corn, which provides trellis for smaller squash and for the beans. The beans provide nitrogen fixation. Uh, as they break down, you gotta have them break down. They don't fix nitrogen into the soil while they're alive. They're actually working with uh, rhizobium, uh, rhizobium bacteria and nodules, if they form nodules, um, and they're, they're making proteins with the plant. Um, they're not fixing it into the soil right then. It's important to know that. A lot of people don't know that. All right, so, uh, and then mixes. So these mixes could be like companion plants, they could be guilds, and they could also be land races. So when I plant, I plant like six to 12 t types of the same, uh, uh, varieties of the same thing. So in other words, if I'm gonna do kale, I'm gonna do like six kinds of kale. And if I'm going to do beets, I'm going to do like 12 kinds of beets. When I do tomatoes, I usually do 40 or 50 kinds. And this idea of mixes is another resiliency, biodiversity, um, stability for your system. Okay, so that was what I was going to talk about today. Thank you so much for listening. I'm going to now check out your guys' questions and try to answer that. Uh, oh yeah, and someone said they added sunflower to their three sisters and it works great. Totally, absolutely. There's this whole debate about uh, the fourth sister and there's a lot of different um, fourth sisters out there uh, that people use um, and it all depends on where you are and what really works well. I liked uh, pairing my system with millet um, because it brought in those small birds and it brought in more pollinators and it created a, an, an edge, a barrier um, to my corn. So that could have been, you know, my fourth sister. Uh, all right, here we go. Let's look at these comments. You mentioned the specific online permaculture, permaculture design course you completed earlier in the video. Can you re uh, please repeat the name? Sure. So I took a, a permaculture design course with Jeff Watton. That was years ago. Um, I know he plans on doing another one at some point. Uh, I, it's not being offered right now. I have a online permaculture course that uses Baker Creek seeds. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I'm here is because I've been using Baker Creek seeds in my courses, my classes, uh, and my homestead for a long time. So if you go to thepermaculturestudent.com, there's free videos. I even have a free introduction to permaculture on there. So if you don't know what permaculture is, that's totally fine. Just go on there and learn for free. It's all there under uh, my course. Week one is free for everyone. So just go up there, the permaculture student online course, click there and you can go to that, okay? All right. Um, hi from Los Angeles. Oh man, it's probably warm there right now. It's a little cold. It was 12 degrees this morning here. It's a little different, you know? 
For corn, I've read that you should mix corn types with other corn, but then read that you shouldn't. Could you clarify? Sure, corn will cross readily. Absolutely, we'll totally want to cross with other corn uh, varieties. Um, there's some varieties that don't cross as easily, like um, the Peruvian photoperiodic type that I work with in North America, they don't cross as easily. But the jumping genes, the spotting, the, 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 the freckles, those jump. So I, they, they cross like crazy. Um, and it's, it's really fun because you can create amazing varieties because they cross so easily. But if you want to keep things pure, you're going to have to bag it and hand pollinate it. And Stephen Smith will be here soon and we can even maybe do a little demo of that to show you guys how that works. All right, so um, looking again, could you talk about uh, greening the desert? Okay, so um, greening the desert. My friend Neil Speckman is over doing, uh, taking part in the Al Beta project. He's been over there for years in Saudi Arabia, working in the desert with uh, settled nomadic tribes, um, helping them uh, continue their animal husbandry the only way that it's possible. And uh, they're grazers traditionally. They, they bring their animals around grazing, but they can't do that any longer. They're not allowed to be nomadic. They're settled. So he has figured out how to turn desert into profitable perennial um, farms that you can run gra grazing through so that the local culture can still be preserved and honored while they make a profit, while they, you know, they, uh, they make honey, while they um, trap water and carbon in the landscape. And he literally can, tra and, he, and he's doing this right now, he's transforming what no, no agronomist would say was arable land into a landscape that is undeniably profitable. He's got trees that, you know, you don't water for two years, but they still can make $200 a year in, their, in the oil from their fruit. And I'm talking about um, Moringa, um, the specific type of Moringa. And so we have this incredible opportunity um, to regreen the deserts and we can do it in the US and Nevada. Um, we can do this all over the Southwest. Uh, it's all very possible. Neil Speckman, um, Jeff Lawton has done work in this regard. There's this Lus Plateau project over in China that has incredible results in six years. They greened an area that looked like the desert, much worse than any Southwestern desert in America, and turned it into a paradise in six years. It's the size of Belgium. The size of Belgium! So um, please check that out. You can Google, you can Google Earth it. So go to Lus Plateau on Google Earth. And just fly around and look at it. Zoom in and see it, because we're looking at a completely, completely new model is emerging for regenerating large landscapes. Most people just don't hear about it because you know the news isn't focusing on uh, solutions right now. <laughs> so um, to inoculate seeds, soak in compost tea. How long? Okay, so um, to inoculate seeds with compost, very, very interesting. The first time I heard of this was, um, was from Elaine Inga. She said you could spray them, you could mist your seeds when you're drying them down originally. You would mist them with compost tea like a foliar spray. And so like I just processed and cleaned all my pumpkin seeds. They're still wet. I'm gonna spray them with compost tea and now I'm gonna dry them down just like I would have after washing them and cleaning them. And that soil biology will dry on it and when you plant that seed, it will be there waiting. It's absolutely incredible. I think we're gonna be doing some trials, testing it side by side so that you guys can get the actual data on that in the field from Elaine. So, uh, I work with Dr. Elaine Ingham. She used to be the head uh, scientist at the Rodale Institute, and now she's uh, doing her own uh, full-on research farm in uh, Oroville, California, that I've been to and filmed. It's absolutely incredible. So that's an awesome thing to do. Um, moving on to the next question. What is your view on starting seeds indoors? Would you recommend certain ones not to start inside? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to start something inside, it should be worthwhile. So it should be worth um, the amount of energy that you're putting into it. It should be worth uh, the amount of time that you're putting into it. And so that means 
be, if you're going to follow that, 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 that uh, rule of thumb, that really depends on your situation and what crops you are choosing and growing um, and, and your, your growing situation. If you, for instance, have a greenhouse that is an extension of your house and it's just passively uh, heated by the sun and there's, there's no inputs, um, no lighting that you have to pay for, uh, that's going to be a completely different situation from someone who um, has to heat it uh, with propane and run it with electricity with lights above. So that answer would, would totally be depend, dependent on uh, the viability, feasibility uh, in relation to the crop itself and, and the time of year too. Okay, so uh, what's the best way to ensure tomato seeds germinate properly? Um, make sure the seeds are, uh, are viable I mean, if the seeds have a high germination rate, then um, there should be no problem germinating them. Uh, remember germination tests? You can take 100 seeds or 10 seeds or 200 or 500, and you would put them in a damp uh, napkin or cloth, paper towel, put them in a bag, um, make sure it's not too hot, um, not cold, and you would maybe in the sun uh, or someplace where uh, it got just enough light and I, I would monitor that way and count. Okay, um, I have an area on my back patio I want to use for growing edibles. Any ideas how to bring, how to build a raised bed on top of concrete? Contain your gardening seems like a less efficient use of that space. Thanks. Yeah, so um, there are a lot of options um, for growing uh, in an urban setting or in a setting where you can't reach the ground. Uh, in desert situations, they'll set up wicking beds where the water will be beneath and then there'll be a, uh, a separation and then the soil and there'll be a way to water directly down to the, to the wicking area and the water wicks upward as it evaporates in the heat. So that's one way um, that, that people would do that. Uh, another way is the standard raised bed, um, but allow it to drain below. Um, and in those cases, I really would focus on the, the quality of my soil, on not tilling. I ran a raised bed garden at the high school I taught at for many years, and I didn't, I didn't cut the soil. I used a lot of bunny manure, um, and uh, what happened was when I left for a full year and a half after I left to continue to grow food, and they kept removing the food thinking it was weeds and it kept regrowing. Uh, and it was something, uh, the, the population of what grew changed every time because they cut it and uh, down at different times. So the soil seed bank had different things that sprouted at those different times of year. And the kids keep sending me pictures of me like, Powers, check this out, you know? And, and they're like, what is this, you know? And uh, it just really goes to show if you design it properly, raised beds can be amazing too, but the biology really has to be there. And that's why I, I say, you know, compost, uh, soil life, no-till, because that prevents you from losing the quality over time, okay? All right, do you recommend grow light? Um, you know, I read, I've read, I've read uh, research that you don't um, get a full light spectrum even from uh, the lights uh, and grow lights. Um, they, really, they really can help us in areas where um, we don't get enough light during those times of year. Uh, the idea though is to try as much as we can to make it so that the costs um, don't outweigh the benefits. The benefit really has to outweigh the costs. Uh, if we're going to use lights. So um, knowing what we're doing, why we're doing it, really influences how we're doing it. Okay, hey Matt, I live in zone eight and I am having a hard time trying a pumpkin or large squash that can hold up well to our heat and squash borers. Definitely prefer not to use harsh insecticides. Yeah, of course. Any recommendations? Okay, so squash borers, you can use DE, diatomaceous earth on, or you can use compost tea. Um, their, uh, their eggs are, are eaten by things um, in the food soil web uh, and in the insect world for sure. Um, respond well to your heat. 
what, where are you? I mean, I was in 8B, I had 140, 120, uh, you know, uh, degree soils in different areas. And uh, I did black futsu squash from Japan that's offered by Rare Seeds. Um, I, I think maybe you need to seed save uh, and maybe go to the local farmer's market and see what they're selling and buy those seeds and seed save those, you know. Um, but squash can handle the heat. They can definitely handle the heat. So I don't think it's that. Uh, it might have to do with your soil and the food soil web in, in, in that spot. Building mounds for squash type plants. How big of a mound do you recommend? I like. I feel like when I did, oh, I lost you. All right, so um, you're, you're thinking of doing the mounds with the corn and the mounds and the squash around it and the beans growing up it. Are you, are you imitating the Native American method? Um, if so, I would, I would tr look up historical accounts and try to mimic what they're doing. And there are people doing it that way currently as part of uh, native um, seed saving uh, programs. So you can Google that and YouTube that and watch them and then you can kind of gauge by looking at their setup, the exact sizes. And that's how I would do it. I have an orchard at our new home, apples, pears, plums, no clue what to do with them this spring to ensure bugs don't eat the first fruits. Um, so I would be doing compost tea. I wouldn't remove any biomass from that area. And if you're really worried about it, uh, do some tests. Maybe get some of that clay spray um, where you just mix like bentonite clay and water, you know what I mean? And you spray it and it puts that fine coating on it. It doesn't hurt the plant or anything, but it makes it so that they, uh, the insects can't really smell it. All right, um, how do I prevent leggy starts? How can I get them to be bushy? So um, a lot of the times uh, vegetative growth um, or, or uh, a burst in growth and, and not enough um, development comes from over fertilizing. And a lot of times it's nitrate fertilizer, so you get like tons of growth and, uh, or it could be watering, too much water. Uh, vigor in like orchards is often caused by too much watering and you get these things called uh, water sprouts and they're weak and they're spindly and, and, and it's because they just have too much of something and not enough balance. They're not enough slow growth happening. Uh, okay, so, um, all right, here, I'm going to refresh and, 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 and see what other questions there are. We are, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and let's see if we can get through some of these. All right, um, are composted leaves enough to make compost tea? Could you take a little bit, talk a little about the method of making compost tea? Okay, so compost, it's really important to remember that compost if you have leaves, those are gonna be brown, right? That's gonna be the third brown. And then we have the third green, and those are from plants that's cut, and it can be dried, but it's from plants that haven't gone to seed. So the leaves are from plants that have done their full cycle, right? They're, it's the end of the year. It's brown. It's them releasing that carbon to the earth. The green is be before it's done all that. So it's got the nitrogen, the enzymes, the sugars, all those things in it, and you're cutting it and then drying it. So they all can be dry. The brown and green thing isn't about um, color or dryness. And then the final third would be the nitrogen, so the manure. So if we're gonna do compost, it's really important that we have all these elements so we get to the right heat, so we get a full reaction and so we have compost that's fully developed, has um, no pathogens, no parasitic eggs, no weed seeds. And then we make compost tea with that. And we wait. We do, we do the full 15 days, rotating 10 times, keeping it to 131, 140 Fahrenheit the whole time, that, that, that sterilizing heat. And then we let it cool. And once it's cool, once it's not hot at all, then we make our compost tea. And then that is what I would use for compost tea. Okay, all right. So how do you turn Kentucky grassland into manageable garden soil? I love that question. Okay, so um, first of all, 
we're 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 working with a certain we're working with a certain subset right of of soil life a ph and we have to disrupt that so the first thing i would do would be, i would be start i would start chopping it i would let it grow and then i would chop it and start comp basically like composting with mulch in place and then i would hit it with legumes and and you could you could open it up um you could cut it you could reset it you could do earthworks it really helps when you do those sorts of things at, at when, when you want to set up a garden area i mean disturbance is what annuals thrive upon perennials thrive on not disturbance it's important to remember that too so if you're going to have annuals it's really important to recognize that you are going to have to disturb to expose soil so the seeds can make contact with the soil regardless so um, I would use legumes. I would use cowpeas profusely, and then I would, um, I would, I would use that, and then compost. I would chop it all in place, and I mean, I, the easiest way to do it probably would be over winter, because then you have all the forces working for you. You're not competing against anyone. So I would start a fall garden in that area, just like I said, and that would die down. And then early spring, I would start the similar garden, just with different, uh, different uh, legumes. And then I would tarp that and then cut that and plant into that. So you would tarp it and you would, all that would start breaking down and you could even till that in or harrow it in. That'd be even better. So you're only tilling the top uh, inch and a half, two inches. Um, but that's, that's what I would do to start that, that process. Cowpeas, compost tea, um, smart applications to the soil, lots of mulch, um, and then timing our cutting. That's what I would do. All right, so uh, how can I plant heirloom seeds next to similar conventional seeds as a transition to heirloom open pollinated seeds? Um, well, it depends on what seeds we're talking about because um, similar conventional seeds, uh, I mean, if they're corn, you can't let them cross pollinate because you'll be contaminating the heirloom. Um, if there are things that you're not seed saving from, uh, and don't require uh, you to let it get to that point for you to get the food, like beets, grow them next to each other. The beets aren't gonna cross until they go to seed. And then they're gonna cross with their Swiss chard and a bunch of other things, right? So, so, so you know what I mean? We, 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 gotta, we, we gotta think about that. We, we gotta keep all our beets and our chard you know, separate. And we gotta to keep our, all our plants. We gotta think about all of our seeds this way. Uh, if we want to keep lines pure. So it doesn't really matter about heirloom or not if we're, if we're growing it for seed, we have to keep it pure. But if we're growing it for food, it shouldn't make much of a difference unless we're talking about like uh, something that requires the pollination to actually make food. Like as in the case of corn. Um, any suggestions on how to decrease the amount of chemical sprays drifting over my planting area from the neighbor's yards? Yes. Make a hedgerow barrier and do it in um, and do it in uh, stages. So what you would do is you would have different um, permeability levels to your plants, and then stagger them. Hey, honey, and then stagger them so that they uh, make a full in in, in um, it interferes fully. So it creates a um, oh, what's the word? Um, an in interception, a complete interception. And then those plants are gonna be hit, right? Those plants are gonna be toxic. And so regularly, you would spray those plants with compost tea. And that sounds crazy, you're like, what do you mean? That's the stuff that's supposed to kill life, right? Well, it's actually Roundup and all those sprays are a bacterial food, something eats it, right? It's something breaks it down and degrades it. Um, when it's persistent in the soil, that's usually because they've been tilling and creating that hard pan layer because it pushes down on the tip of the till. It may cut above it, but it's pushing down below it and creating an uh, impermeable layer. And that's where all that uh, Roundup collects. And yes, that would be a really big problem um, there. But compost tea consumes that. And that's why when you uh, are rehabilitating a field that has been uh, rounded up a lot, you would rip it or till it, and then you would compost tea it as you do it, or mix compost into the top a uh, few layers as you break up that compaction layer. And I'm not, um, 
making that up. Um, Elaine Ingham did it. Dr. Elaine Ingham did it because she, the property that Celebration Farm is on, they sprayed so much Roundup on that they had that compaction layer. So she's done it. It's real, and she's actually this year scaling up to do all this testing and proving all this stuff on an industrial scale size field. So we're gonna get a lot more uh, data soon on that. All right. So uh, can I put baked beans straight into my garden? Um, are they plain baked beans? Are they salted baked beans? Um, eh, they're gonna just attract bugs. The thing is, if we don't compost the food and we put it directly in the garden, it'll attract something to compost it. So a bug will come along, eat it, and then its waste will be something more garden appropriate. Uh, same thing with animals, they'll eat it and their waste is more garden appropriate. Something will come along to translate that into composted material, you know, whether it's through a digestive tract or something else. Um, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I just kinda... I, I'm gonna refresh one last time. Uh, we have three minutes till four. It's been an hour and it's been awesome. I really appreciate you guys. Uh, and I will double back uh, for the next 20, 30 minutes and answer all the questions I missed. So don't worry if, if I haven't answered it live, I'll get to it. And all right, here we go. I'm just, I'm just looking at the last, I'm just looking for one last question here. It's not pulling up, so that must be must be a sign that uh, we'll reconvene on Monday. And here at the seed bank, we've got a lot of selection for you guys to put all these ideas into effect. We're here, we're filling your orders, we're, we're, we're talking about you guys every day. You guys are calling us every day. And uh, we're really excited. Uh, we feel like this year is gonna be a bigger year for gardeners than it's ever been. Uh, you know that there's never been more gardeners on the earth than there are now, right? You're one of them. Have a great one.